You have to imagine there's a big triangle. So this is the it's so-called Piana Rotaliana. It's 700 hectares of total surface. Um, it's three sides. So you have on one side the Monte di Mezzo Corona, this mountain. The second side is the Grandos. So you have this mountain cutting. So you obviously the peak goes towards the, there is a valley opening up in the back called the Val di Non. And the third side is the Adige River or the Adige Valley. So basically this is where encapsulated in this triangle. Uh, this is a river delta in fact. So you had uh, during the last ice age you had an accumulation of ice and snow in the back and especially around the, the Dolomites. So there is um, a mountain chain called the Brenta which is made out of Dolomite stone which is a limestone, a young limestone with a different component of magnesium. So Dolomite stone is basically well, it's a thing that uh, Mr. Dolomieux in the late 1700s discovered that actually the Alps are not all made in the same period or they're not made out of the same stone, but there is these newer deposits that are Dolomites and so they're scattered around the Alps. So you have them in Veneto, but they're not overall. I mean, the Dolomites are not in one place, they're in several place, places. So during the last ice age, when the ice melted, um, uh, what today is the river Noce, which passes between here and the mountain wall, that's the residual river from that melting. So basically the water came, made its way through here and started to cut out, you know, to just break down the mountain, just open up. So this was washed with sand and obviously with all the dolomite and also different types of uh, mountain stones like uh, the Presanella, so there's also some porphyr and other stones and limestone that were just uh, rolled down the mountains from the melting glacier and deposited here together with the sand. So this means that the closer you are to the river that today still exists, the Noce, the more of these pebbles you have because obviously the heavier stuff stays closer to the more intense water flow and uh, the rest is just washed with sand. So in terms of soil we have a, a sandy surface, um, sandy bottom, so the, the ground is actually quite deep and there is a, this layer of dolomite pebbles um, uh, that varies in its intensity, wow. thickness and uh, in the types of stones depending on where you are in this plain. So even though we are in alluvial delta, the soil differences are these stones, which if you have a higher density of these stones, obviously the roots of the grapes have to move around more, so they become a bit more complex and tend to not have such an opulent growth in terms of leaves. So it tends, they tend to have more density on the grapes, more less fruit, but also denser fruit. Um, while if you have a more sandy substrate, like in the case of Sgardzon, obviously the roots go down easily. The plant has more, um, it's more vigorous. So it shoots more, it concentrates less on the fruit, but more on the plant growth. And so you tend to have lighter, crunchier, juicier wines, let's say, with less density, which back in the day would be less qualitatively highly regarded vineyards, but obviously luckily we're getting over that definition. In the sense that obviously in terms of ageability, like if you value a, a bottle or a vineyard based on how long it can hold in the cellar, well then you will always have a little bit of an advantage in the denser um, uh, parts. But in reality, the variety in our case makes more difference in terms of aging because we have high acidities, a lot of fruit, a lot of dark blue color. We don't have a lot of tannins. So what makes our wines age is actually the acidity combined with the anthocyanins that are contained. We have the second high, it's the variety with the second highest anthocyanins in Italy. After a variety grows in Verona, which is called uh, Goppello. So this is a very um, old um, agricultural uh, landscape like grape uh, like to make wine here is very historic since the Roman past probably also before but when the Romans basically built up the roads to go and beef with the Celts and the Swiss you know um, they established the first settlements in the valley which was kind of a pain in the ass because you had a lot of malaria you know the river Adige would go over so it wasn't like the f best thing to do that's also why most of the villages are built against the mountains or on the mountains. Like in the valley, usually there was nothing. Now there's intensive agriculture and some new villages and cities. But the river was only channeled in the late 1700s, like from the Habsburg regime, so from the Austrians. So until then, there was um, uh, not much living in the valley, but there was a lot of doing stuff in the valley during the seasons where it wouldn't be aggressive. Um, so 
the wine culture here, on the other hand, because this river is very small and you have very easy to work soils and you were quite far away from the main river, so when it would go out, it wouldn't wash all in. This was always a place where viticulture was safe. Um, also, you're protected by the mountains. So on one hand, the sun goes up there and goes down behind these mountains, as you can see now, which means that the Monte di Mezzo Corona is shined on basically all day, so it charges up with a lot of heat. It's our heating system. Um, and also, since the sun goes down there, the shade starts in Mezzo Lombardo and moves then towards Mezzo Corona, which is the other village, which means that you always have half an hour at least less direct sunshine in this part compared to the other side, which creates two different areas in terms of wine production, in terms of density, because you add it up during the whole every day of the year. And also you have the heat source of the, you know, the heating system during the night of this uh, thing charging up with heat, which accentuates, with polarizes even more this distinction between warm side and cold side. This makes a broader distinction. And also, by the way, the river passes there, so you don't only have more direct heat, not more, also more direct sunlight, but at the same time, you are also closer to the bigger amount of dolomite pebbles. So it tends to condense even more. So this is the structure. And we're, I mean, we're looking southeast, and this is northwest. So basically, the warmer sites are looking, are, are the northern sites, and the southern sites are the cooler ones. So the more you're here or towards the valley, the lighter and the crunchier the wines. The more you go towards this mountain, the denser and the well, more opulent sides. So that's why we have Moray on that side and Sgardonis on this side. To also have the same vinification, the same age of plants, to just have a direct comparison on the two um, terroirs, let's say. Also, what's worth mentioning is that this heating up of the mountain creates a thermal inversion. So basically the hot air, the hot air going up pushes down cold air, which is in, in the early morning from these valleys in the mountains. You have fresh winds coming into this part and drying up the soil, which is very important for us because you know, still the main problem is uh, mildew. And uh, that's why all the vineyards are planted facing these winds. So we don't plant facing sun, we plant facing winds. Also because these winds are not available to other, you know, to our neighbors. So it helps us a lot. Plus the variety. So Teroldego, which supposedly comes from Tirolo gold, the gold of Tyrone, was a, is a very ancient variety um, genetically. It's the uncle of Syrah. So the direct connections are with Syrah and the variety called Duretta in France. Um, it is, uh, as I said, good acidity, big fruit, um, resilient grapes. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not attacked by uh, like, you know, a lot of flies. They don't go in. It holds against uh, humidity very well. It has been um, over centuries adapted on growing on pergola. So the plant tends to go up and grow horizontally immediately, which makes it terribly, f that's terrible for Guyot. So Teroldigo doesn't like Guyot at all, but you know, it's still fine. These were, these, we planted this in the 80s, so we needed a little bit more of density right away because um, Teroldigo on Pergola goes into overproduction very heavily in the first 20 years. So you get too much production. So it, in the 80s, it was hard for us to think of a wine that was, you know, that you could sell in a bottle um, that would come from high production vineyards. and. Today it would be different, but uh, at the time my mother decided with my father to plant Guyot to immediately have a lower, um, uh, lower quantities, to have more density and it was more palatable for the market at the time. And we were starting out, I mean, still today Teroldo, nobody gives a shit. Like, there is no sommelier waking up in the morning thinking about what Teroldo you should have put on my wine list. All the wine that was produced in the Adige Valley was always going north. This was the most southern tip of the German-speaking realm. In, you know, from, from the late Roman times until uh, basically today, it's still the same. So, you know, people drive down here. In the Middle Ages, they had to go to see the Pope to guarantee their power, you know, because obviously, you know, divine power justified uh, secular power. So basically, when, you were, when your son was becoming king, you kind of went to the Pope. So they drove through here. They saw that the climate was different. 
that you had more opulent productions. On the way back, they would basically start to trade stuff from here. And it was like, what today would be the, what in the 80s was the Primitivo for the Italians, you know, the southern warm red wine, was this area for the Germans. Yeah.